What's up, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Fantasy Mafia Podcast, NBA edition. We are in the middle of our NBA mini series where we are going through each and every team and recapping their 2019 2020 season, as well as previewing their off season. My name is Jordan Jica, a.k.a. Dr. Fantasy, and I am here with my co-host, The Fantasy Caveman. Today is going to be our last team in the bubble that did not make the playoffs. Well, technically, they got to play the play-in game against the Trailblazers, but I've decided right now that doesn't count as making the playoffs. So they're our last non-playoff team, the Memphis Grizzlies. Last season, they went 34-39 and under head coach Taylor Jenkins. Their points leader was Ja Morant, rookie of the year, 17.8 points a game. Jaron Jackson Jr., 17.4 points. Dylan Brooks had 16.2 points. Jonas Valchikonis had 14.9, almost 15 what points a game. That for- that was a- yeah. I've never heard it pronounced like that. <laughs> How do you pronounce it? I say, I say Valanchunas. Valanchunas? I've always said Valchikonis. <laughs> that sounds so weird. That's what you get with foreign guys. People say it's yeah. even okay. It's funny you say that because even in announcing duo, I forget who it was one night, but it was a uh, a European player, and they both said his name differently. And I'm like, you guys are sitting right next to each other, and you can't even say it uh, the same way. So that's how bad it can be. We'll just call him. Uh, how do you want me to pronounce his first name? I say I say I say Jonas. Jonas, like Giannis, Jonas. Jonas. (laughs) Okay. Jonas had 14.9 points. Brandon (laughs) Clark at 12.1 points. And I'm going to have to say Jonas's name a few times here, so that's why we got to be on the same page. He uh, led the team in rebounds with 11.3. Jay Crowder was on the team for about 30 games, was uh, 6.2. He's now with the Miami Heat during their playoff stretch. Brandon Clark averaged 5.9 rebounds. Gorgi Dang had 5.8 rebounds. Assist Ja led the team with 7.3. Tyus Jones was second with 4.4. Steals, DeAnthony Melton off the bench had 1.3. Jay Crowder had one. And then blocks, you had Jaron Jackson Jr. leading the way at 1.6. Jonas at 1.1. Gorgi Dang averaging one block per game as well. Caveman, who impressed you this year from the Grizzlies? Valencianus. No, but that's what it looks yep. like. Okay, so, yeah, I was, I, sorry, I, I quickly looked up how to actually pronounce Valencianus. his name. Val- Valencianus. <laughs> that doesn't sound right. Valencianus. What? Valenci. Valencianus. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's, that's that sounds that. about right. <laughs> Jonas Valanchunas. Jonas Valanchunas. There we go. I get, I got it right. I'm right. So that's all that matters. Uh, so uh, looking at a couple uh, guys that uh, really impressed me this year. You're gonna start. Obviously, you gotta start. You gotta talk about John Moran. I mean, I mean, he's gonna be impressive if he won Rookie of the Year. Uh, I'm gl- I'm glad they didn't like. Kind of didn't drink the Kool Aid and somehow give it to Zion. You know, oh, I love Zion. From you. It is. I love Zion, but he didn't nearly play. Zion actually finished third in rookie year voting. So they wrote that Kendrick Nunn finished a very, very distant second. Mm-hmm. So uh, you look at John Morant. I mean, impressive with uh, the 18 points and seven assists. She also shot a uh, solid forty-seven percent from the field. I think his shot, his he had, he had his shot selection was pretty impressive for a rookie, in my opinion. I think uh, you look at John Murray. I think he looks like he he's the future. He's the future. He looks like he can he can be the future star of the Grizzlies. Uh, they can kind. Of, I think he's the type of guy that you know. I think he's you can build around him. I think he's a he. I think he ha, he would be a guy that'd be very fun to play with. he 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 just he just has that persona and just that that uh that just good at that just good attitude that just makes you want to play with him. 
Uh, then, obviously, uh, Jaron Jackson, who was among the le- their leaders in a lot of categories there. Uh, I think a lot of, what a lot of people don't realize about Jaron Jackson, he shot 39% from three-point range this year. Very solid uh, three-point three point, uh, game, which is going to be big uh, for them going forward. I think he's, he's a guy... He's a guy that complements John Morant very well. Him and I think him and John Morant is a is a solid duo there together. Uh, it'll be interesting to see where they play Jaron Jackson going forward. Do they play him at the four, or do they play him more at the five? I think that'll be an interesting thing looking forward for uh, Jaron Jackson. But I. I love this duo they have in Memphis going forward, and we're uh, and we're a f- it seems it seems like uh, they they did a pretty good job of shaking that kind of that gr- old Grizzlies grinded out tough basketball and kind of they kind of tore that down, and then they got they they bring in guys like Morant and Jackson to kind of usher them into a a new way of new way of playing so yeah those two guys very impressive yeah it's gonna be fun to watch them moving forward I mean these are two guys Jaws 21 right now Jaron Jackson's still only 20 years old and I don't think a lot of people realize that so he showed a huge leap in year two and I think seeing him and Ja grow together is gonna be really fun to watch and you mentioned it you can talk a lot about these young combinations but this is probably one of the best gelling young combinations in the entire league it was really unfortunate when Jackson went down at the end of the year and it's one of the reasons where the why okay. the Grizzlies really started to slip but well, What's hey, it made, it made it made for much much more entertaining bubble action. That's true, yeah, because they lost their grip. Everyone were, was kind of assuming going in that the Grizzlies were going to be the eight seed, but they slipped out of the playoffs for a few days, and then they kind of grinded their way back up to the nine seed to have a chance at the play-in game. But yeah, I mean, Jaron Jackson and John Morant showed a strong pick and roll game. That's going to be fun to watch moving forward. And yeah, I mean, you already mentioned it, but this is a great combination. They still are going to need to add some pieces around these two, but they definitely have a core. And uh, you and I talked about this quite a few times just throughout the season, but they were ahead of schedule. I mean, I don't think anybody thought the Grizzlies with a rookie and John Morant leading the team were going to even be in the playoff conversation. So as disappointing as it is that they didn't make the playoffs officially, I mean, they were way better than anyone would have ever guessed, and they were miles ahead of where we expected them to be. So I think that's great progress for them. It's kind of unfortunate that that they don't have a first-round pick this year, and that went over to the Celtics because I think they could have added another exciting piece there to add with that core. Realistically, they're probably just going to have to rely on Ja and Jaron Jackson improving in next season in order for them to take another step forward because I don't know how many opportunities they're going to have to add pieces unless they go after a big free agent, which I don't know how enticing Memphis is to a big free agent. But with a young core like that, you never know who they end up getting. Uh, So that'll be fun to monitor, but we'll go into uh, their depth chart here and keep going through what we uh, more looking towards the off season here. So, I've already mentioned a lot of these names already, but at the one, John Morant is their starting point guard. Tyus Jones and DeAnthony Melton off the bench actually both provided pretty solid depth throughout the season. And I know those aren't big names, but when they were called upon, they played some uh, tough minutes off the bench. At the two right now, they have Dylan Brooks starting, who averaged around 16 points a game. DeAnthony Milton played the two as well. Uh, Justice Winslow is in Memphis right now as well, played some minutes off the bench. And good old Grayson Allen also plays uh, for Memphis coming off the bench for him. At the three, they have Kyle Anderson currently starting, former Spur. Behind him, they have former top five pick Josh Jackson, who uh, has been a pretty big disappointment thus far in the NBA. John Conchar, who we'll talk about as one of their free agents. Not too much, but got to throw him in there. Yeah. Uh, 
At the four, they currently have Anthony Tolliver listed as their starter. Brandon Clark played a lot of those minutes, and he's another young guy we didn't mention, but he -hmm. played a lot of great minutes for them at the four, averaged 12 points, and only 23 years old right now, made a lot of strides, and uh, he's an interesting name to move forward as the Grizzlies continue to improve. And then at the five, you have Jonas. Brandon Clark is listed as their backup. Then they also have Gorgie Dang. Uh, so any notes you want to make on this depth chart? Uh, yeah, I mean, they're, they're an interesting situation because you look at uh, usually when a team doesn't make the playoffs, you could look at them and say, okay, they need this or they need this. The Grizzlies, you know, they have solid depth around the board. Uh, I just, I just think it's a lack of firepower with them. Mm-hmm. They just don't have. I mean, they have Ja, but you're not Ja, ja Morant as good as sensational he was his rookie season is not enough to vault the team into contention. So you don't think so? How rude! I mean, he's no, he's, it, not. he's no saying he's no. I mean, yeah, I can't even I'm trying to think of the last time a team made the playoffs with with just relying on one guy the entire year. So, I I think I saw it. It was Giannis. Oh, hey, <laughs> remember Middleton was an All Star and averaged twenty points a game. I guess he was Middleton, solid, but. Uh, so looking forward, we'll talk about some of their upcoming free agents. Uh, first is Jonte Porter, Michael Porter Jr.'s younger brother, actually. Uh, then they also have Josh Jackson, who I mentioned, coming off that rookie deal. Uh, DeAnthony Melton will be a free agent. Anthony Tolliver probably is just going to retire at this point. He's 35 years old, unless somebody throws decent money at him. Can't really see him returning. John Conchar, and then Yuta, how do we want to pronounce this name? I said, Wantanabe? I said, Wantanabe? Wantanabe? Wantanabe. Watan. There's an extra A in there. I feel like I want to add that A in there. Wantanabe. I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I, I only have two I only have two A's down on his name. Oh, according to basketball reference, there's three A's. So oh, is there? I guess, I guess it where's depends. The, but, where's the other A? It's uh, right before the B-E at the end, so oh. Wantanabe. Oh, oh. Okay. That's the way that I'm going to... Watanabe, Watanabe. Either way, he's not even relevant. He was on a two-way contract. <laughs> Here we are debating how to say his name. and He doesn't matter. But um, the only one that's interesting to me, in my opinion anyway, uh, Josh Jackson, I don't expect to get a very big contract. Maybe they bring him back for some depth. But DeAnthony Melton is the interesting one to me. When they dealt with some injuries, he did start a few games. He played some tough minutes off the bench. He's a great defender. When you talk about the old school way of Grizzly basketball, I think DeAnthony Melton kind of fits into that mold. And not to say they, uh, I think players like that are still important off the bench in today's game, even though you don't want to build your team around them. I think having a guy like that is really important. So if I had to prioritize it for him, he probably, depending on the deal Josh Jackson's looking for, I may consider giving him another chance moving forward. Uh, just because he does have that upside, but you know, someone will probably overpay for him. And then, D- but DeAnthony Melton is the one that sticks out to me. Yeah, I mean, not a lot of big. They could lose all of these guys and probably not get hurt that much moving forward. Uh, DeAnthony Melton's restricted, so I think him. You see him, and then you see a guy like Shabazz Napier, kind of just another one of those solid backup bench point guards that could command a fairly decent salary and uh on the open market so we'll kind of see if anybody throws some solid money at uh uh D'Anthony Melton and just uh all the guys you mentioned Josh Jackson's the only unrestricted one everybody else is uh restricted I don't think none of them matter enough to make a difference either way I mean that sounds I'm sorry to all these guys. I know they're in the NBA, and that that's an accomplish that's that's an accomplishment to even make it to the NBA. But they just don't matter that much moving forward. Yeah, no, I agree. They're more depth pieces that can be easily replaced. So 
Uh, I guess we'll move over. Not much to talk about there to their off season needs. Uh, I'll let you go first this time. What do you have for their off season needs? Okay. Uh, First thing, I actually think it's going to be tough because of his contract. But I think they should look to the, 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 uh, trade Jonas Valanciunas. Uh, I think not, not that he was bad. He was actually very solid for them last year. Uh, had Averaged over 11 rebounds, you know, gave them that, gave them some tough minutes at the five. But I think... Uh, it's to the point where I think if Jonas if Jonas stays around, I think it's kind of... I wouldn't necessarily stay stunning the growth of uh, Jaron Jackson and Brandon Clark, but I think it kind of... It kind of holds them back from just letting uh, letting them grow and uh, learn. I think one of the biggest things, and this is uh, the probably the biggest downfall... Uh, Jaron Jackson's game is he doesn't know how to defend without following. He follows out so much, which is probably a reason why they wouldn't get rid of Valanciunas yet. Uh, but I think, I think if they want to see these guys grow into their full potential, I think they should kind of look at trading Valanciunas and kind of getting something they need more. Uh, uh, I think. Another thing, I see the thing they don't really need uh, a ton. I'd say so. It's why it's not the worst thing that they don't have a first round pick. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, my needs are not even position based. I think it's more of decisions on how they want to do things moving forward. They I think I've mentioned already, but they need to decide whether Jackson's a four or a five. Going forward, uh, if they if they think Jackson's more of a five, then they should look to trade Jonas uh, Valanciunas there. Or you know, if they decide that Jaron Jackson's a four, then you're going Valanciunas at the five, and you're bringing Brandon Clark off the bench, who I would like to see him start. I think uh, I like I would like to see him start with uh, Jaron Jackson and John Moran and Dylan Brooks. I think you have a, you'd have a very young and exciting starting lineup. So that's that's my question to you. What do you think? Do you think the Grizzlies should try to look to move uh, Valanciunas this offseason? I mean, me personally, I like Jonas in the way that in the role that he plays for a team. I mean, and as much as the NBA changes, you know, I still think it's nice to have that defensive presence because he's a strong defensive presence at the five, Jonas, right now. And uh, Jaron Jackson, I think, is just a different kind of player than Yona. So I think they can complement each other pretty well, actually. Cause, uh, and I don't think that – I think uh, you're going to see Jackson be more of a modern big man where he can stretch the floor a little more than Yona. So I don't actually think that they uh, interfere with each other much. Uh, I mean, he's making $15 million right now for the next two years. So I don't think that's unreasonable. The contract they need to move on from, and I didn't even realize this till I just pulled it back up, but Gorshi Dank's making $17 million this season. That's since he's their highest paid player, Gorshi Dang. And uh, this is I mean, his last not, year. He's not terrible. No, but he's terrible for $17 million. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I personally think I'd hold on to Jonas. And, you know, if you get rid of him, you have to ask yourself who's going to replace him. I think realistically. So, um, you know, it'll be kind of interesting because if they keep Jonas, he's probably going to stay at the five. You have Jaron Jackson at the four, um, who I didn't even mention on the depth chart before because he was injured, but technically he's their starting for Jaron Jackson. Now that's silly of me not to even mention that, but Brandon Clark who played tough minutes moves to a bench role then. And, you know, I think that's probably a little more suitable for him because they do need some punch off of the bench uh, you know, one of the things that I would look for if I was them, I like Kyle Anderson. I liked him when he played with the Spurs. But that's the definition of, like, a role player off the bench for me. Kyle Anderson really shouldn't be your starting three. So unless they plan on playing Jonas, Brandon Clark, and Jaron Jackson on the floor all at the same time, I think they really need to look to add some firepower at that three. 
<clears throat> and I think an interesting fit, and maybe defensively he's not a great fit, but I talked about Gallinari in a previous episode. I think it'd be really interesting if you put him at the three, and I think he could actually really mesh with the core that they have now. I don't know if they necessarily have the cap space right now. They don't have as much as you would think just because some of those guys – even Justice Winslow making $13 million. A lot of these guys are making $9 million plus. So uh, I think they could probably fit one more big contract. Another guy, and you mentioned it earlier in the episode, and to me, I agree. I don't know if it's a specific position as much as they just need a little more offensive firepower. But another guy that I think is interesting this offseason is Fred Van Fleet from the Raptors. You know, he's more known as a scoring guard. I think you could move Dylan Brooks over to the three. I like Dylan Brooks, actually. He's a, a better three and D uh, guard slash forward than Kyle Anderson is. So I'd definitely be keeping Dylan Brooks in the starting lineup. But you can move him to the three, put Van Fleet at the two. And I think that would be a really interesting lineup as well if they can convince him to come over. So those were the two names that I had. Because I do think, I don't think they need another role player. I mean, I could talk about Tony Snell like I did in the last episode, but yes. I really don't think Tony that does Snell the Grizzlies. Every episode. Yeah, that's the new guy. But I, I just, I don't see him making a big enough impact. I really think they need to go out and there's not a lot of huge names this off season, but there's, you know, solid role. Pl- I mean, Fred Van Fleet and Gallinari aren't just role players. They're kind of that next level up, whatever you want to call in between role player And they're above starters, too. You know, they're above average starters in this league and on the verge of being all-star caliber, but not quite there. I think the Grizzlies need firepower like that, especially with no first-round pick. Otherwise, like I mentioned earlier, they're just going to be relying on these young guys taking the next step forward, which isn't the worst thing because you really hope that John, Jaron Jackson, and Brooks, and all these guys, Brandon Clark, can take the next step forward. But I think it wouldn't hurt if you added another offensive force there. So that's the direction I hope to see him go in, and I think it would really help make this lineup uh, a lot stronger. Yeah, I mean, those. that's a... I like that. I think another... Uh, another guy who I think would make sense for them. What do you think about Malik Beasley? So funny enough, I actually had him as my third name that I didn't actually just bring it up in the episode, but in my notes, I had it mentioned Malik Beasley is a restricted free agent. And Mm -hmm. uh, I, I did. That's funny. I had him as my third option. I didn't say it verbally, but yeah, I think that he would be a nice offensive force as well. He's probably more of a depth piece. I don't know. I I mean, I guess it's the same situation. You move Dylan Brooks to the three. You play Malik Beasley at the two, potentially. And I didn't even mention that moves Kyle Anderson to the bench. So your bench is becoming a lot stronger if you do that. So if they're looking, I think Malik Beasley is going to be cheaper than Fred Van Fleet and Gallinari. But he has a lot of offensive upside. So, yeah, I think that one would be great as well. Yeah, uh, I I think... uh... They're also, I mean, they have Valanciunas, but outside of that, they're a very young team. I think they could use just kind of like a nice, solid role player wing type guy. So the prototypical names, Jay Crowder, I think would kind of that that would be that'd be in, Jay Crowder's mentioned. Everybody that needs a veteran wing, there have Jay Crowder. We'll just we'll just clone Jay Crowder <laughs> and just have a clone of Jay Crowder on every team, and then problem is solved. Yep. Yeah. No. He's per. I mean, he reminds me of when Damari Carroll was younger. Just gritty defensive players who, uh, you know, they have offensive yeah. ability. That's not what they're known for. But yeah, Jay Crowder would be fun on the scene. I doubt that he comes back because they traded him, but it's possible. I mean, yeah. I mean, who knows? I mean, like I said, they don't have a first rounder this year unfortunately which i mean not the worst thing i don't think they really need needed a first rounder per se i mean obviously you want yeah. if you have a chance <laughs> but, but I'm, i don't think it's really the end of the world for them to not have a first rounder i think they can kind of continue to develop the guys that they have uh that that first rounder is oh was is belongs to the celtics because of the Jeff Green deal back in 2015. Oh my gosh! That's how that's how the Celtics had the Grizzlies pick. Is the Jeff Green deal back in 2015? 
Wow. The Celtics are experts at though. How does how does Danny Ainge do it? He he finesses and swindles the guys all the time. This is just craziness. He maximizes value. I mean, Jeff Green had a big season. He traded him. I think it was top six protected from what I was yeah. reading. So it yeah. just kept rolling over every season because the Grizzlies have been terrible and they had a top six protected pick. And finally, they're not in the top six. So it's the Celtics. <laughs> Event, yeah. So not really. I mean, I'm a, I'll, I'll throw I'll throw Cassius Stanley out there. Uh, a lot of people probably don't know a ton about him, but he has a lot of. Yeah, he has a, he has a lot of he has a lot of potential. He has some some Duke ties, so just like I said, with no first rounder, it's kind of hard to project out what the what's going to be available for the Grizzlies with their second round pick and whoever they get's probably with all their other young pieces they already have and developed, probably not going to make uh, much of a difference there. Kind of kind kind of kind of kind of sucks. You kind of. Kind of, I know we, we really like talking about who we see uh guys who we see where guys go in draft, but the Grizzlies just just don't just Jeff they they I think it would have been this would have been a situation for them to be bad one more year. So they can have one last one last, they should just should just be bad forever so they never have to give them get OB top in and move on. Yeah. Never be bad. Anthony Edwards maybe would make more sense for them, but either way, all right, let's look forward and uh, what, where we have them finishing moving forward. The Western Conference is always interesting because you can probably make the case for, oh, not every single, but almost every single team in the West to make the playoffs somehow. And the Grizzlies, as much as I want to say they don't have a chance, I mean, you saw them fight and come very close this season. So uh, I think a lot of where they finish could depend on what they do this offseason. If they stay the same with what they have and depend on their young guys developing, they'll probably be in a similar situation where they're fighting for the eight seed once again. So, you know, once again, similar to uh, the Suns when we just talked about them finishing anywhere between 7 and 10 or 11 potentially with a record hovering around 500. Now, if they decide to go out and get a bigger name like Fred Van Fleet, Gallinari, I think that would make them a really interesting team. And all of a sudden, maybe you see them more as a solid 7 rather than clawing and fighting for a playoff spot. Yeah. But either way, I think this is more of a team. If we were going to do dynasty standings, they would be higher on those than they will it's be not, directly. Dynasty team. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Top 5 dynasty. So uh, if you wanted to go that way. But next season, we, we already saw this year they were competitive. So they're definitely going to at least be in the race next season, no matter what moves they make. Yeah, I mean, they're just... They don't. They don't have the most amount of cap space because the guys, several unnecessary guys making nine plus million, kind of hampers them to uh, really do a ton in the market going forward. But yeah, I mean, there's no reason to say that they can't at least do what they did last year and fight for that, uh, fight for a playoff spot. Like as far as Jackson and uh, Morant just need to continue to grow. Uh, they take if they take they take leaps together. You can you can easily see the Grizzlies clawing in uh, to the eighth spot. They're just not. I uh, see that's that what sucky thing with the Grizzlies is. I think even if uh John ja Morant and uh Jaron Jackson live up to their full potential and their ceiling, they're still probably no better than the seventh seed, to mm-hmm. to be honest. And that's the kind of it's just one of those things where no they're not gonna be able to unless they somehow once all these horrible contracts come off the books, if they're able to somehow convince a third Guy like like you said like if like you said if a Van Fleet which I don't expect a guy like Van Fleet to go to Memphis, but if they were to get a guy at least of that caliber, then maybe you're talking to a team that could 
slide up a spot or two into the uh, seven, maybe six seed if they got if they got a third star slash superstar on their team. But with how they're present presently constructed and how you, I see it going forward, they're probably I mean not the worst spot to be in. I mean for it, you, if you can compete for a playoff spot, that's what you want. But they're and it's uh, unfortunate that they're probably the Grizzlies. Grizzlies ups uh, upside as a team is probably capped right now. Yep, I would definitely agree with that. Any other final notes you want to make before I wrap it up? Uh, nope. All right. So that's all that we have for our Memphis Grizzlies episode. Next, we'll be moving into the next few teams that got el- or the first teams, I guess I should say, that got eliminated in the NBA playoffs. So make sure you tune in for that. If you don't already, make sure you go and like the Fantasy Mafia on Facebook. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Subscribe to our podcast, whether you listen on Spotify, Google, or Apple Podcasts. And make sure you go check out our Facebook group, the Fantasy Hotspot. That's a place for you guys to talk all things sports. Any sports you want, uh, NBA, NFL, MLB. K-Man gets mad when I say NHL, but no, hockey no, players are no people, need to talk too. NHL. That's unnecessary. <laughs> if you want to talk about tennis, go ahead. You can throw that in there yes. if that makes you happy. You can talk about tennis over NHL. Serena Williams won a match yesterday. I know that. So if you want to throw that in there, go ahead. But uh, we appreciate you guys for listening. Make sure you subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Yep. Yeah.